A Social History of Anthropology in the United States by Thomas C. Patterson. Anthropology in the Post-War Era, 1945 to 1973. Optimism greeted the war's end in 1945. The GI Bill of Rights in 1944 guaranteed veterans college educations and low interest loans to purchase homes. And the Full Employment Act of 1946 promised jobs for everyone. American corporations whose factories had reaped enormous profits from the war effort would soon collaborate with the federal government to rebuild the destroyed economies of capitalist Europe and Japan, and this post-war reconstruction, once underway, promised even greater profits for such companies. However, there were threats to these optimistic visions of the future. The military was slow to discharge soldiers and sailors for fear of flooding the labor market, and more of 600 strikes in 1946 alone threatened the corporate profits. By the spring of 1947, a number of Americans took these omens of the fact that civilization itself was in peril. In their view, the threat was both internal and external. The communist fifth column threatened America at home, and the communist seizure in power in Czechoslovakia and China, as well as the Soviet Union efforts to thwart the creation of the independent state in West Germany, imperiled civilization abroad. After the Soviet Union exploded an atomic bomb in 1949, they spoke even more passionately of the need to contain the threats they perceived. The government assented to their demands, narrowed free political discussion, and trampled the rights of thousands of citizens and foreigners alike as it implemented policies of containment. In the process, the government spent trillions of dollars fueling corporate profits, and the military stockpiled weapons for of every imaginable kind. For the next 50 years, every American was caught up in the eerie movie simultaneously directed by optimism and by the fear of nuclear annihilation. The Cold War, precipitated by the United States and England and adopted by other capitalist countries to halt the advance of socialism, was one of the two shaping features in the post-war era. The other was decolonization. The colonial subjects of the United States, Britain, France, and the Netherlands used the opportunities provided by the overall weakness of the imperial states in the wake of the Second World War to proclaim political independence or to launch popular movements, armed and otherwise, to gain autonomy. By 1960, more than 1.3 billion people, more than a third of the world's population at the time, had gained independence as a result of the successful national liberation movements. If the socialist second world was forged in the crucible of the Cold War, then the third world, composed of newly independent countries, was created as struggles for political independence spread across Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Pacific Islands. American anthropology was transformed in the years following the war. American Indians and rural communities in the United States were no longer primary objects of inquiry for American anthropologists. Internationalism, forged during the war, was now fueled by post-war reconstruction, the Cold War, and national liberation struggles. The GI Bill sent nearly 2.2 million veterans, 2.1 million men, mostly white, and 67,000 women back to school after 1946. Veterans doubled the number of college students in the United States and significantly altered campus sex ratios through the late 1950s. More than 2,000 new college and university campuses opened their doors during the 1950s and 60s. The new schools constructed the primary labor market for anthropologists with advanced degrees and underwrote the shift in the profession's center of gravity from government work back to the academy, effectively reversing the trend of the preceding 15 years. The growth and transformation of academic activity from the late 1940s onward was fueled mostly by the Cold War expenditures that provided fellowships as well as research funds and incentives. It had a number of dimensions. First, it underwrote the organization of knowledge and the development of new fields of learning, such as computer science, primate studies, or paleoanthropology. Second, the discourses of established areas of learning were shaped and transformed in tandem with the changing needs of the state, for instance, the Rockefeller, Ford, and Carnegie Foundations' 
which link their overseas programs to the policy objectives of the United States, shifted their support for areas of studies shifted from Latin America to the Soviet Union and China after 1947, then to the newly emergent nations of Africa, the Middle East, and South Asia, in the words of a Ford Foundation official, situated along the periphery of the Soviet communist orbit, in 1952, and finally to international studies. Third, the Foundation supported lines of inquiry, such as behavioralism or functionalism, that countered more radical social theories which had gained prominence during the Depression. Fourth, graduate students and faculty members receive steadily increasingly levels of support for study and research from both the federal government and private philanthropies. For example, the National Science Foundation budget grew from $100,000 in 1951 to $100 million a decade later. And by 1953, the Ford Foundation was already spending $2 million a year on foreign area studies. Fifth, certain subjects, such as Marxist contributions to anthropology or social thought, could not be discussed openly in the academy for fear of political reprisal. As a result, academic discourse and research were narrowed as they were channeled in certain directions and not others. The repercussions of this channeling is still felt today. Sixth, in the late 1940s and early 1950s, a number of anthropologists lost their jobs in the academy because of their political beliefs and activities. Two decades later, a number of anti-war graduate students in the anthropology were blocked from academic positions for the same reasons. In both periods, some anthropologists acted as gatekeepers, some were informants who provided the FBI and other investigative agencies with misinformation about their colleagues and students, and some, fearing for their livelihood, used pseudonyms, avoided conflict, or wrote in ways that obscured their political and theoretical beliefs. The Reorganization of American Anthropology, 1945-1953 to At war's end, more than a hundred anthropologists, roughly a sixth of the profession, worked in Washington. About 25 of them met during the summer of 1945 to found a new society that would be comprised exclusively of professional anthropologists who could define the essential core of anthropology, counteract the centrifugal tendencies in the discipline, and mobilize the resources of the whole profession for a broad range of internally and externally oriented activities. Its provisional constitution required all members to have either a doctorate or to be employed as anthropologists. Their membership would have to be approved both by the membership committee and two-thirds of a proposed executive board, which could subsequently disqualify them for a violation of scientific ethics. Many of the Washington anthropologists believe that the profession could have been more involved in the war effort and policy-related activities. They also believe that the discipline would have received higher levels of financial support from various research councils if anthropologists had been more engaged. An organizing committee comprised of Julian Stewart, Clyde Clacone, John Province, Frank Roberts, and Homer Barnett sent the proposal to their professional colleagues in anthropology, many of whom responded angrily. They saw it as a threat to the integrity of the American Anthropological Association. Nevertheless, the proposal touched on important concerns. By the time of the 1945 annual meeting of the AAA, the proposal had been replaced by one concern with reorganizing the association itself. A committee on reorganization, chaired by Stewart, was named to examine the issues involved. Its aim was to reintegrate the linguist, archaeologist, physical anthropologist, and applied anthropologist into the institution. At the 1946 annual meeting in Chicago, which was the first of the large meetings whose members had to deal with the de facto Jim Crow segregation of the hotels, the Constitution and bylaws recommended by Stewart's committee were adopted. The new Constitution created a two-tier society. This distinguished fellows, those with doctorates, from members, 
students and those who were not employed as anthropologists. And it placed control of the AAA in the hands of the fellows who elected officers selected from the slates that were provided by an executive board composed exclusively of fellows. Stewart's committee also made a series of recommendations to the executive committee. These including developing area studies programs for foreign service personnel, creating a plan that would benefit anthropology if a National Science Foundation were established, surveying anthropological curricula in universities and opportunities for introducing it into schools below college level, broadening the scope of the American anthropologist, and forging closer relations with other anthropological associations, such as the Society for American Archaeology, the American Folklore Society, the Linguistic Society of America, and the American Association of Physical Anthropologists to explore matters of mutual interest. What the AAA did not do in the late 1940s and the early 1950s was to come to aid of those fellows and members, such as Gene Weltfish or Richard Morgan, who lost their jobs because they had been called to testify before the state and federal legislative committees investigating un-American activities. While the executive board of the AAA claimed neutrality in Morgan's case, one of its members, George P. Murdoch, actually wrote a four-page letter to J. Edgar Hoover that contained a list of anthropologists who he believed were communist or communist sympathizers. Anthropology was redefined. Much of the progressive or overly radical thrust it had in the 1930s was muted. Partially suppressed but not completely eradicated, the new version of anthropology borrowed Boaz's vision and came to view itself as a discipline that was divided into four fields. Ethnology or cultural anthropology, linguistics, archaeology, and physical anthropology. Alfred L. Krober, the doyen of American anthropology, in the 1940s and 1950s, wrote the mythic charter for this newly reconstituted endeavor. It was his anthropology, a thick green-covered volume established in 1948 that juxtaposed, if not integrated, chapters on ethnology, linguistics, archaeology, and physical anthropology. This was followed five years later by the proceedings of a Winter Green Conference called Anthropology Today, an Encyclopedic inventory, which Krober edited. It contained several dozen papers by leading practitioners in each subdiscipline. It was followed immediately by the publication of a commentary volume appropriately called An Appraisal of Anthropology Today, in which participants described and explored the implications of four-field anthropology. A few years later, Soltax, Sherwood Washburn and others began to examine in more detail how four-field anthropology was integrated. The post-war years witnessed a veritable explosion in the number of anthropologists. The individual membership of the American Anthropological Association more than doubled between 1945 and 1948, increasing from 678 to 1,723. By 1960, it had grown to 3,174 men and women. By 1967, it had risen to 4,678 to 3,510 men and 1,168 women. The growth of the profession was underwritten from 1945 through the late 1950s by the GI Bill students. 97% of whom were men. From the mid-1960s onward, it was sustained by young men and women born during the post-war baby boom, the children of veterans who attended college in roughly equal percentages. The post-war years also witnessed a rapid increase in the number of undergraduate and graduate anthropology programs. In the 1950s and less so in the 1960s, Many of the new programs were housed in joint departments where anthropologists and sociologists shared resources under circumstances that they themselves did not create. These conditions were the bureaucratic and budgetary construct of deans and provosts. In 1958, Alfred Krober and Talkin Parsons, the leading figures in American anthropology and sociology at the time, 
provided their colleagues with the rationale for distinguishing the two disciplines. Many academic bureaucrats were convinced by the weight of Kober's and Parsons' reputations, if not by the strength of their arguments. As a result, many of the joint anthropology sociology departments, Temple and UCLA, for instance, were dissolved and replaced by separate degree-granting departments. These newly created freestanding budgetary units were distorting mirrors of what reflected in complex ways the autonomy proclaimed for the two disciplines. A common pattern in post-war expansion of anthropology programs was that cultural anthropologists who received their degrees in the 1940s or early 1950s founded the new programs. They hired another ethnologist or two, then archaeologists, then a physical anthropologist and a linguistics to round out the curriculum. The rapid growth of other fields began about five years later than that of the AAA. For example, the demand for archaeologists, judging by the membership levels of the Society for American Archaeology, intensified after 1957 and persisted at high levels into the early 1970s. Given this history, it seems likely that fewer archaeologists, physical anthropologists, and linguistics had experience in joint departments where the divisions followed disciplinary lines separating anthropologists and sociologists. Instead, they were hired into academic settings where the separation was either already a fake, a comply, or imminent. Thus, the ever finer distinctions anthropologists began to draw were within the discipline itself. As a result, anthropology departments increasingly became the loci of subdisciplinary turf wars once their budgetary linkages with sociology were dissolved. The growing importance of area studies from the late 1930s onward was transformed the organization of anthropological research. By the early 1940s, large research projects involving the collaboration of a number of anthropologists became commonplace. Mitra's study of race relations in the Office of War Information's studies of natural character were two examples. The large projects of the post-war years built on the experiences gained earlier in the decade. Let us look at the object of inquiry in institutional support for the few of the big science area studies projects undertaken by anthropologists in the post-war years. These enterprises had a shaping effect on anthropological research by selecting certain problems and modes of inquiry as important they had channeled their own inquiries and those of some contemporaries in particular directions. Ruth Benedict, whose The Chrysanthemum and Sword was widely acclaimed after the war was contracted in 1946 by the Office of Naval Research, which urged her to expand the national character research she had done for the OWI during the war. The ONR provided nearly $100,000 for the Columbia University Research in Contemporary Cultures project that Benedict developed in collaboration with Margaret Mead, Ruth Bunzel, and Ruth Valentine. It employed more than 60 individuals, graduate students, professional anthropologists, and social scientists, as well as emergies, displaced persons, and refugees from Russia, Eastern Europe, and China, who were organized into a series of work groups that met regularly for the next year and a half. Like their predecessors in the OWI, the teams were concerned with societies that were inaccessible to researchers, not because of war, but rather because of revolutions, destruction, and travel restrictions imposed by the American government. In Mead's words, we then faced a situation in which we have access on the one hand to many living and articulate individuals whose character was formed in the inaccessible society, and on the other, to large amounts of sorts of materials, books, newspapers, periodicals, films, works of popular and fine art, diaries, letters, the sort of materials with which the social historian has learned to deal without the benefit of interviews with living persons. By combining the methods of the historian with those of the anthropologist, who is accustomed to work without any documented time perspective, we have developed a new approach. After Benedict's untimely death in 1948, 
Mead continued the study of cultures at a distance with two successor projects that were carried out under the auspices of the American Museum of Natural History, Studies in Soviet Culture, founded by the Rand Corporation, a Cold War think tank that carried out classified research for the government, and Studies in Contemporary Cultures, funded jointly by the ONR and the Center for International Studies at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Mead and Rhonda Metro summarized the results of these investigations and their study of culture at a distance. In 1946, Clyde Clarkone, Talcott Parsons, and others at Harvard established the Department of Social Relations in order to promote interdisciplinary collaboration between social anthropologists, sociologists, and social and clinical psychologists. A year later, Klukon was named the director of Harvard's Russian Research Center, which was established with 740,000 ostensibly provided by the Carnegie Corporation. Klukon was involved in a web of relations that linked the Social Relations Department and the Russian Research Center with various government agencies, philanthropies, and academic programs, including the FBI, the CIA, the Air Force's Air University, Harvard's Department of Anthropology, and the MIT Center for International Studies. In 1950, he directed the center's project on the Soviet social system, which was based on interviews with refugees and defectors from the Soviet Union, as well as Eastern and Central Europe. He and his associates at the center were also concerned with understanding Russian national character and the distinctive character of the Bolshevik elite. At the same time, Klukon organized and gained funding from the Rockefeller Association for Harvard's Comparative Study of Values in Five Cultures project that was carried out between 1949 and 1955 by graduate students and junior faculty affiliated with the university's departments of social relations and anthropology. One goal of the National Character Studies of the Soviet Society, undertaken by the New York and Harvard groups, was able to predict how its leaders in rank and file were likely to act when confronted with particular situations. Benedict, Mead, Klukon, and their associates assumed that the members of a given culture share certain common, sufficiently distinct ways of handling emotional drives and regulating social conduct from which form a unique lifestyle that differs, often markedly, from the lifestyle of other cultural groups. The norms of a, the group specify how an individual must manage the key tensions generated in social living and how the social control of violations of these norms, mechanisms of guilt and shame, disposal of repressed hate, operate. Both the New York and Harvard researchers pointed to differences in character of the Soviet elite and the mass of the Russian population. However, they presented the results of their investigations in different ways. The New York researchers focused on the cultural character of Russian society. They sought to discern the relation between Russian culture and the dominant personality types that were produced in individuals by primary institutions such as child-rearing practices or family organizations that were expressed in secondary institutions such as folklore, art, or religion. In contrast, the Harvard group framed their analysis of Soviet society in terms of how unspecified changes in the social system affected the modal personality patterns and adaptive patterns of behavior among the rank and file that allowed its members to participate in and adjust to the communist social political order. Benedict, Mead, Klukon, and their associates were relativists who believed that the culture of one society often differed markedly from the lifestyles of other groups because of the different ways in which their members learned to deal with their emotions and to regulate their conduct. They viewed culture, forms of social consciousness, and their manifestations in language and material objects as the principal force shaping human interpersonal and social relations. Thus, there was a limited relativism that did not subvert objectivity. The idealism of their perspective resonated with the views of Emile Durkheim, who believed that morality 
and religion dictated the sentiments and ideas of a group and regulated the actions of its members. The culturalist perspective of the area studies conducted in New York and Harvard contrasted with those of social or cultural evolutionists, notably Julian Stewart, Leslie White, and a number of archaeologists who stressed cross-cultural regularities and adopted a base superstructure or layer cake image of a society in which the base has seen as narrowly economic and determining the contours of social and cultural layers of the group. Thus, for evolutionists, Benedict, Mead, and Clacone were in error when they located the driving motor of change in the cultural superstructure rather than the economic base of society. Furthermore, their cultural relativism, regardless of how limited it was, obscured regularities in human social and cultural development and important correspondences between the social institutions and cultures of societies at the same level of economic development. Several of the big science area study projects carried out in the late 1940s eschewed cultural relativism and sought instead cross-cultural or societal regularities. These studies were framed in terms of economic determinist and evolutionist perspectives. The earliest of these was the Institute of Andean Research Vero Valley project that was carried out in 1946 by Wendell Bennett William Strong, Gordon Willey, and other archaeologists in a small valley on the north coast of Peru. Their goal was to uncover a complete historical sequence from the remains left by the earliest residents through those of the first farmers to rise of civilization. They were largely successful in this effort, and by 1947 they had already adopted an evolutionist perspective to organize the presentation and discussion of their evidence. The archaeologists recognized that their discussions about the rise of civilization in the Viru Valley manifested an elaborate conception of history as a series of cultural stages that began by hunting and foraging bands and culminated with modern civilization. By 1950, Julian Stewart had elaborated this scheme in his view Following the hunters and foragers, they were small communities of incipient farmers. Later, the communities cooperated in the construction of irrigation works, and the population became larger and more settled. Villages algalmanated into states under theocratic rulers. Finally, culture ceased to develop, and the states in each area entered into competition with one another. One or another state succeeded in dominating the others, that is, building an empire. But such empires ran their course and collapsed after some years only to be succeeded by another empire not very different from the first. For the historian of this era of cynical conquests is filled with great men, wars, and battle strategy, shifting power centers, and other social events. For the culture historian, the changes are much less significant than those of the previous era when basic civilizations developed, or those of the subsequent Iron Age when cultural patterns changed again and the centers of civilization shifted to new areas. The Industrial Revolution brought profound cultural changes to Western Europe and caused competition for colonies and for areas of exploitation. Japan entered the competition as soon as she acquired the general pattern. The realignments of power caused by Germany's losses in the First World War and by Italy's and Japan's in the Second are of social order. What new cultural patterns will result from these remains to be seen. The general assumption today seems to be that we are in danger of basic cultural changes caused by the spread of communism. Russia acquired drastically new cultural patterns as a result of her revolution. Whether communism has the same meaning in other nations remains to be seen. Stewart recognized limitations of this concept of world history. It was too general. In certain areas, such as cultural possessions, it did not fit neatly into it. Thus, in 1947, 
Seward, who had moved from BAE to Columbia University, sought and soon received funding from the SSRC and the Rockefeller Foundation to investigate the effects of 50 years of American culture contact in Puerto Rican society. It was to be a joint venture with the Social Science Research Center of the University of Puerto Rico. The Rockefeller Foundation believed that the Puerto Rico project would contribute information useful for guiding and assessing its programs of social and economic transformation stabilization at home and abroad and would further develop of universal theories of social change. The goal of the project was to study the social anthropology of the country with modern civilizations of different kinds of folk cultures that have come under some form of Euro-American or Russian dominance. It was concerned with finding out how the influences emanating from a highly industrialized society, such as the United States, affected the local and regional varieties of culture found in one of its agrarian dependencies. Stewart described Puerto Rico as an American colony that was agrarian, rural, and economically part of a capitalist world in that it depends upon export crop and imports nearly all of its manufactured goods and about half of its food. The cultural heterogeneity of a society was due to the differential penetration of the processes by which production, social patterns, and related modes of life were selectively borrowed from the outside and adapted to local needs. The result of the investigations carried out by Stewart and his associates appeared in the people of Puerto Rico, which is one of the first attempts of anthropologists to portray a national society. In Stewart's view of the social structure of the island was composed of two interdependent features. One consisted of a series of distinctive localized sociocultural subgroups that were cross-cut by class, ethnic, and other social categories that are, were arranged hierarchically throughout the island. The other was a set of formal institutions, such as economic relations or the legal and government system that constituted binding and regulating forces. These institutions, he wrote, have aspects which are national and sometimes international in scope which must be understood apart from the behavior of the individuals connected to them. Furthermore, the engines of change penetrated Puerto Rican society through these institutions. Research carried out by Sidney Mintz and Eric Wolf on Stewart's Puerto Rico project laid the foundations for a critique couched in unacknowledged Marxist analytical categories of Redfields and tax pre-war discussions of the folk societies in Yucatan and Guatemala. It was solidified the basis for studying peasant communities. Mintz challenged the utility of Redfield's folk urban continuum, which view culture change in terms of increasingly complexity, resulting in increased communication from folk communities and city dwellers. While agreeing that the typological characterizations were useful, Mintz pointed out that Redfield did not take into the account the rural proletarian communities found on the Hequin plantations, which constituted the backbone of Yucatan economy. Wolf showed that the types of peasant communities in Latin America were more diverse than Redfield and Tax supposed. Some peasant communities were concerned with subsistence. Others consisted of farmers who sold some or all of their produce in the market. Still others were composed of rural wage workers. Mintz and Wolf provided an alternative understanding of the linkages that existed between various types of rural cultivators and national economic and political structures. They did not view these peasant communities as exploited producers left over from a pre-capitalist system of production, nor did they see them as a class-rooted tradition that was disappearing in the wake of capitalist social relations. They saw them instead as communities that were molded by the same special forces that were shaping urban societies in Latin America. Micronesia, the Pacific island groups captured from the Japanese during the war, constituted a third kind of area study for anthropologists. 
the United States established military governments on these islands as they fell under its control. Early in the war, officials in the State Department and Department of Interior had favored establishing a series of trusteeships in Micronesia under which the island groups would be prepared for independence, whereas those in the Navy Department advocated their annexation. George P. Murdoch, who, along with his Yale colleagues, John Whiting and Clennon S. Ford, had taught at the Navy School of Military Government and Administration since its inception, was a leading advocate of the Navy's viewpoint. After providing the Navy with the cross-cultural survey research on Micronesia, Murdoch, Whiting, and Ford transferred to the Naval Office of Occupied Areas for Micronesia in the closing months of the war to set up military governments. In 1946, Murdoch supported a plan drafted by Harvard anthropologist Douglas Oliver, which called for the central organization to administer scientific research and close control over the activities of civilian visitors in regard to mobility and access to native populations. Felix Kessing, Edward C. Handy, and others who had already worked in the islands opposed the plan. At the same time, Laura Thompson, John Embry, and John Unseen expressed their dismay at the arrogance and insensitivity of the military governments already established by the Navy. President Truman's announcement in 1946 that the United States would retain control over the islands of Micronesia after the war signaled victory of the Navy's agenda over the internationalist and anti-colonialist views found in the State Department and the Department of the Interior. The Navy also found the proposals of Murdoch and Oliver more to its liking than those of the anthropologists who had already worked in the Pacific. Consequently, they supported the agenda over the academic veterans of war agencies. In November 1946, Murdoch received $100,000 from the Navy to collect data that were relevant for island government. He established the Coordinated Investigation of Micronesian Anthropology, which employed 25 cultural anthropologists, three linguistics, and four physical anthropologists to collect these data in the late 1940s. A number of CIMA employees subsequently became the administrators or staff anthropologists employed by the governments of the trust territories. The anthropologist in the trust territories was, as Robert Redfield commented a decade later, an arm of administrative action who provided the administrator with special knowledge to guide his action. Redfield made this remark in context of the discussion of action anthropology. The term action anthropology was coined and used by Soltax and his students in relation to their work among the Fox Indians of Iowa who had two overarching goals, to understand the processes of acculturation that were taking place in the late 1940s and to intervene in those processes to help the Fox community improve the quality of everyday life. Action anthropology, in their view, involved helping communities create the possibility of choice. It also involved solving problems and learning something in the process. Two action anthropology projects were initiated in the late 1940s and the early 1950s. One was the Fox Project, which achieved certain educational benefits for the community and helped establish a community-owned craft company. The other was the Cornell Peru Project, launched by Alan R. Holmberg in collaboration with the Peruvian Indian Institute. Cornell University rented the Vicos Hacienda and its surf-bound labor force for a period of five years. The goals of the project were twofold. On the theoretical side, it was hoped to conduct some form of experimental research on the process of modernization now on the march in so many parts of the world. On the practical side, it was hoped to assist the community from a position of relative dependence and submission in a highly restricted provincial world to a position of relative independence and freedom within the larger framework of a Peruvian national life. Over the next decade, the anthropologist directing the project would intervene in everyday life of the community in various ways, training leaders, developing decision-making skills, introducing new crops, supporting the community's efforts to purchase the hacienda, 
and inadvertently fomenting gender inequality among its members. Anti-racist arguments gained ground in the United States after the war, partially because of anti-Nazi sentiments and racism's unsavory connections with Nazism, and partly because of the improved standards of living experienced by many Americans. In October 1949, the Director General of the UNESCO convened the Committee of Experts on Race Problems, a panel of anthropologists and sociologists, to collect materials concerning problems of race, disseminate this information, and prepare an educational campaign based on data. Ashley Montague, the reporter elected by the group, circulated the statement prepared by the committee to a number of scientists for criticisms and suggestions. The revised statement on race drafted by Montague was finally released on July 18, 1950 by UNESCO's Mass Communications Department. On the same day, a New York Times headline announced that no scientific basis for race bias found by a world panel of experts. The UNESCO statement asserted that the mental capacities of all races are similar, that no evidence for biological deterioration as a result of hybridization existed, that there was no correlation between national or religious groups and any race, and that race was less a biological fact than that a social myth. The UNESCO statement on race attracted immediate attention. It indicated a significant shift in the United States with regards to the concept of race. Nevertheless, its claims that biological studies lend support to the ethic of universal brotherhood in that man is born with drives towards cooperation, and unless those drives are satisfied, men and nations alike fall ill, provoked criticism from the right. A second UNESCO committee composed of physical anthropologists and geneticists, including Montague, was convened to deal with these criticisms and issued its statement on the nature of race and race differences in July 1951. The second statement retreated from the claims of the first. It accepted the ideas of race mixture and racial classification, but reserved judgment on the question of whether there had ever been pure races and ignored altogether the statements about universal brotherhood and cooperation. The second UNESCO statement signaled that the issues of race and racism could continue to attract attention of anthropologists in the years to come. American Anthropology in the Cold War, 1954 to 1964. The rising tensions of the Cold War led the Ford, Carnegie, and Rockefeller foundations to consider carefully the relation between their overseas programs and the foreign policy objectives of the United States government. From 1953 to the mid-1960s, the Ford Foundation provided 138 million to 15 American universities, all of which had doctoral programs in anthropology, to develop non-Western language and area studies programs. The goal of these programs was to train American scholars in particular areas notably Africa, Latin America, South Asia, the Near East, the Soviet Union, and Eastern Europe. The Ford Foundation also funded the development of an international studies programs at MIT, Harvard, Georgetown, Berkeley, Princeton, and Stanford. Ford and the other foundations saw themselves as intermediaries between the overseas specialists they supported and the federal government. They believed that the specialists should provide for the government with information about the nations they studied. As a result, many scholars in the newly established area and international studies programs had close ties with government agencies. For example, Max Milliken, the first director of the MIT Center for International Studies, which was established in 1952 with Ford Foundation and CIA funds, co-authored a report with Walt Rostow for the director of the CIA regarding the economic policies the government should promote in Southeast Asia and the Far East. Other scholars had offices down the hall from Milliken and Rostow and received their salaries from the same sources. Milliken and Rostow provided a blueprint for the interdisciplinary development and modernization studies that were carried out by social scientists 
including anthropologists in Asia, Africa, and Latin America during the 1950s and 60s. American foreign aid programs should, in their view, combine economic and political agendas to develop the infrastructures of underdeveloped countries and to support the export-oriented sectors of the local elites in order to promote capitalist modernity and to create an environment in which societies which directly or indirectly menace ours will not evolve. The important questions for modernization theorists were how to identify and how to support those classes or groups in underdeveloped countries that would promote capitalist economic development. Many modernization studies carried out in the 1950s and 1960s presumed the superiority of the political culture of the United States and implied the cultural and racial inferiority of peoples in underdeveloped countries. Such perspectives were not shared by the leaders of newly independent nations in Asia and Africa who met in Bandung, Indonesia in April 1955 to discuss common problems such as maintaining their independence and resisting Western domination. They advocated instead non-intervention or interference in internal affairs of other countries, the peaceful settlement of international disputes, respect for the human rights outlined in the UN Charter, and recognition of equality of all races. Their belief that the newly independent states had the right to choose their own political, economic, and social system would become the cornerstone of the movement of non-aligned countries in the 1960s. In other words, there was a fundamental difference of opinion between the American advocates of modernization and the leaders of non-aligned nations of Asia, Africa, Europe, and Latin America who wanted to pursue independent lines of economic and social development. Indonesia was an early focus of American modernization studies. From 1952 to 1954, Harvard anthropologist Douglas Oliver directed the Ford Foundation-funded Rajakudu project sponsored by MIT's Center for International Studies. Clifford Gertz, then a student in Harvard's Social Relations Department, participated in the project. In his early publications, Gertz focused on the historical development of the Javanese economy and how it shaped the post-war situation in Indonesia. The economy, in his estimation, was part of a broader process of social, political, and cultural change. Consequently, a search for the true diagnosis of the Indonesian Malis takes one thus far beyond the analysis of ecological and economic processes to an investigation into the nation's political, social, and cultural dynamics. His analysis of the Javanese rural economy was couched in terms of marginal utility theory. What happens to productivity or output when a worker is added to or subtracted from the workforce? What effect does this have when the land has already reached its maximum output? Gertz ultimately saw modernization as a part of a broad process of change that was shaped at some fundamental level by the values of the cultural system. Thus, he rejected materialist conceptions of history that were concerned with economic growth and gave primary importance to the economic base. These included not only Marxist analysis, but also the economic determinist arguments of Julian Stewart, Leslie White, and other cultural evolutionists in the late 1950s and 1960s. By relocating the motor of development from the economic base to the cultural realm, he incorporated most immediately the views of Clyde Cluckhone and Talcott Parsons, his teachers at Harvard, and more distinctly of Emile Durkheim, who believed that morality, religion, and law dictated the ideas of a group and regulated the action of its members. The important transition for modernization theorists such as Gertz was the shift from traditional society a catch-all category composed of diverse groups with primitive technologies oriented toward agricultural production, to a dynamic, modern, social type whose cultural values promoted economic growth and high mass consumption. During the early 1960s, modernization theorists such as Gertz 
who was by then affiliated with the New Nations Project at the University of Chicago, became increasingly concerned with what happened after nationalist movements succeeded and they had to confront the effects of primordial attachments on the constitution of the new civic or national identity. These primordial attachments were culturally assumed givens of social existence, ethnicity, tribe, race, language, region, culture, or religion that shaped the search for identity and the demand that those identities be acknowledged publicly in the new states. They were unleashed by the same forces that buttresses movements for political independence. While they could be a motor for progress, rising standards of living, and more effective political order, they could also impede or block the creation of new civic identities and values. Some new states attempted to domesticate culturally prescribed identities in their social statistics, dress, official histories, and symbols of public authority in order to aggregate them into larger, more diffuse units so the state bureaucracy could continue to function without serious impediments. Other modernization theorists, such as the political scientists on the SSRC's Comparative Politics Committee, were less concerned with the developing democratic institutions in the new states than with creating political regimes, even authoritarian ones, that could maintain political order and promote conditions that were favorable to American interests. From the perspective of modernization theorists, Steward, White, and the other cultural evolutionists that missed the proverbial boat, the cultural evolutionists did not address the problem that rose increasingly during the 1950s as a result of decolonization. Soviet foreign aid and political opposition to capitalist development in non-aligned nations, how to identify and support those groups that would promote capitalist development in the third world. At the same time, however, cultural evolutionism and the idea of progress were becoming the dominant theoretical framework of archaeologists as exemplified by Gordon Willey and Philip Phillips' widely read Method and Theory in American Archaeology. The different theoretical underpinnings of those anthropologists concerned with modernization on one hand and the archaeologists on the other exuberated centrifugal tendencies that already existed within the discipline and fueled the almost complete separation of the two subfields that prevailed at Harvard after the foundation of the Social Relations Department and at the University of Chicago after Gertz and other anthropological theorists of modernization arrived in mass in 1958 and Sherwood Washburn departed for Berkeley. Because of the anti-communist hysteria and repression provoked by the FBI in the Cold War, few American archaeologists writing in the 1950s actually used the terms cultural evolution or social evolution because of linkages widely perceived at the time between evolutionist and Marxist social thought. Such sentiments were conveyed in Morris Oppler's red-baiting of a discussion of Leslie White's cultural evolutionism. Apparently, the practical toolkit Dr. Meagers urges upon the field is not quite as new as she represents, and its main contents seem to be a somewhat shop-worn hammer and sickle. With some caution, the archaeologist elaborated two strands of evolutionist thought in the 1950s, even though they rarely made use of the term in repressive political climate of the decade. One was rooted in the economic determinism of Stewart and White. The other built on Spencer's and Durkheim's notions of increasing social differentiation. Willie at Harvard was a leading proponent of the former, and Robert Braidwood of the University of Chicago championed the latter. Both took to heart Walter Taylor's assertions that archaeologists needed to move beyond the construction of cultural sequences and that they should begin to explore the cultural and social dimensions of societies whose artifactual remains they had excavated. Both adopted a kind of developmental functionalism that focused attention on the functional interconnections between the different parts of culture. Both examined the rise of civilization in terms of succession of social types 
that were characterized by particular subsistence techniques and functionally related forms of social organization and culture. Both assumed that civilization, class stratified state-based society, was a natural outcome of social evolution that was achieved in some areas and blocked in others because of natural environments that limited or prevented agricultural production. Willie used the concept of settlement patterns to develop a series of snapshots of everyday life, first on the Peruvian coast, then in the lowlands of eastern Guatemala. Settlement patterns referred to the way in which a man disposed himself over the landscape on which he lived. It, the concept, refers to dwellings, to their arrangement, and to the nature and deposition of other buildings pertaining to community life. These settlements reflect the natural environment, the level of technology on which the builders operated, and the various institutions of social interaction and control which the culture maintained, because settlement patterns are, to a large extent, directly shaped by widely held cultural needs. They offer a strategic starting point for the functional interpretation of archaeological cultures. In Willie's view, the existence of permanent villages, fortified towns, temple mounds, irrigation works, or cities refracts the economic and sociopolitical organization of particular ancient communities. Stable villages, which were based on the capacity of agricultural economies to produce surpluses, were prerequisites for increases in population size and density and for social differentiation. The internal organization of these stable farming villages ultimately underpinned the rise of class cultures and states. In the mid-1950s, archaeologists began to consider the functional and evolutionary implications of community settlement patterns. While Willie focused largely on synchronic relations that constituted particular communities, Braidwood's functionalism was mainly diacritic. He was concerned with the processes of change that led to the development of food-producing economies in the Near East. In his view, civilization appeared not because of the increased efficiency of the early food-producing villages, but rather because of the elaboration and further development of social, political, moral, and religious forces that made possible the integration of the growing population into a functioning civilization. The appearance of new social institutions and more diverse understandings about nature and the purpose of life within the community underwrote the rise of civilization after permanent agriculture of villages, temples, and market towns appeared both in the hilly flank and riverine areas of the Near East. The comparative evolutionary perspective deployed with increasing frequency by archaeologists from the late 1950s onward was concerned with explaining the underlying similarities of development in different cultural traditions rather than their divergent or unique features. They sought cross-cultural regularities at the same time as paying attention to the historic specificity of each tradition. Their perspective was regional and comparative. Their methodology was avowedly scientific. Because of this, Brainwood and Willie were the first anthropologists to receive research grants from the National Science Foundation. By the late 1950s, anthropologists were using cultural evolutionist arguments to explore questions posed by Marx and Engels. For Robert M. C. Adams, Braidwood's student, the early stages of civilization were characterized by regional networks of agricultural villages that were integrated by individuals whose authority devolved from their positions as religious spokesmen. For a time, it seems probably that the religious elite played an increasingly important role in the administration of group activities as well as communities grew larger and more complex. The increased complexity and heterogeneity of a community, the products of increased social differentiation, which was partly a product of the elaboration of the temple establishments, slowly eroded the effectiveness of purely religious sanctions as the glue that underpinned the moral order 
and the mechanical solidarity of the community. In the process, other forms of authority, materialistic or civil, arose at the expense of the temple figures and the opposition to their activities. The centrifugal effects of this struggle underwrote the formation of a social class structure and state. Adams, who engaged the writings of Marx as well as those of Durkheim, observed that these class and state structures were sustained and reproduced by goods and services wrung from the farmers and artisans who were engaged directly in production. In The Sons of the Shaking Earth, Eric Wolf examined the dialects of class and state formation on the one hand and resistance on the other. He describes circumstances in pre-Hispanic Mesoamerica, where the elite class, hungry for surpluses, began to look beyond the confines of its domain to other domains. Power exercised within the society grows into political and military power exercised against the outside. Through widening conquest and widening trade, the solar system of the favored area becomes a galaxy, absorbing the constellations of villages and towns beyond its limits, building a super-regional ecology under the aegis of the growing state. Class and state formation, in Wolf's view, was a two-way street in Mesoamerica. The humble way of life found in the communities of direct producers was never completely suppressed by emergent states. It resurfaced repeatedly, often in a fury of burning and destruction, which left the temples and cities in ruin and relegated in their ruling classes to bad memories. Once Mesoamerican villages were enmeshed in capitalist social relations, he wondered whether the processes of class and state formation had become a one-way street, and whether the classes of direct producers would find it increasingly more difficult to reduce or eliminate exploitation. As the Darwin centenary approached, other anthropologists also considered the implications of Marxist social thought for the elaboration, refinement, and further development of cultural evolutionary theory. In 1959, Marshall Salins at Michigan drew a distinction between specific and general evolution. Specific cultural evolution recognized the historical specificity of the developmental trajectories that occurred in particular places. General cultural evolution focused on the processes underlying the successive transformations of culture through its several stages of overall process. While Salins acknowledged the connections between contemporary cultural evolutionary thought and Marx's analysis of the rise of capitalism, his colleague Elman Service explored the linkage in more detail. Service was concerned with two features of cultural evolution, the developmental potential that existed within a given form of society, and phylogenic or local discontinuities in cultural development. To elucidate principles, he turned to Elon Trotsky's discussion of the law of uneven and combined development, which he elaborated in his History of the Revolution. This law meant that underdeveloped civilization has certain evolutionary potentials that advanced one lacks. Service quotes Trotsky to the effect that Although compelled to follow after the advanced countries, a backward country does not take things in the same order. The privilege of historic backwardness, and such a privilege exists, permits or rather compels the adoption of whatever is ready in advance of any specified date, skipping a whole series of intermediate stages. The law of combined development reveals itself most indubitably in the history of and the character of Russian industry. Arising late, Russian industry did not repeat the development of the advanced industrial capitalist countries, but inserted itself into this development, adapting their latest achievements to its own backwardness. Thanks to this, Russian industry developed at certain periods with extraordinary speed. Later in the paper, 
service quoted with the approval of Mao Zedong's rendering of Trotsky's law. Nothing is written on a sheet of paper which is still blank, but it lends itself admirably to receive the latest and most beautiful words at the latest and most beautiful pictures. In a phrase, service's discussion was both a critique of modernization theory and a radical alternative to their views about the potential for change possessed by the underdeveloped nations of the third world. At the time, his message was largely unheard by the profession whose members were more interested in the evolution of social organization. Archaeologists and cultural anthropologists were not the only ones paying attention to cultural evolutionary thought at the time. From the late 1940s onward, Sherwood Washburn had urged his physical anthropology colleagues to replace their typological constructs with the core ideas of the new synthesis of evolutionary theory. The genetic diversity of populations and the modification of gene frequencies through selection, mutation, and drift. He was successful in this effort partly because of the persuasiveness of his arguments and partly because of the summer seminars in physical anthropology that he had organized with the financial support of the Wenner Gren Foundation for Anthropological Research. Washburn had started his career teaching comparative anatomy at the Columbia University Medical School. At his early research, he was concerned with how behavioral patterns were manifested in anatomical structures such as the pelvis or the hand. In the mid-1950s, Washburn and Virginia Avis pointed out that bipedalism, tool use, and speech distinguished human beings from apes. While these behaviors did not fossilize, they could be inferred from anatomical structures and from the reconstructions based on close studies of fossil forms and modern primates. In their discussion of evolution of human behavior, they reconceptualized the biological notion of a population as functionally integrated social group and redefined the key problem of evolutionary behavioral science as the origin of adaptive behavior in a functioning social group with adaptation seen more in terms of the integration of groups than in terms of differential reproductive success. Culture was the human adaptation. It manifested and repetitive behavior that could be inferred from pelvis, brain, and anatomical structures. These linkages allowed Washburn and his students in the late 1960s to focus their attention on the origins of human sociality, on those features that were characteristic of all human groups. The foundational features involved cooperation, sharing, a gender division of labor. Washburn's Man the Hunter hypothesis reaffirmed the biological basis of human sociality as well as the biological unity of mankind. The hypothesis sparked diverse kinds of research in the 1960s. The Ford Foundation provided financial support for field studies of primate social behavior. The National Science Foundation and private donors contributed more than four million to search for new fossil hominids and their artifacts. In the National Science Foundation, the National Institute of Mental Health, and the Wenner Green Foundation, among others, underwrote field studies of hunter-forager societies such as the Son of Kalahari. Interpretations of such diverse studies provided impressions of what proto-human and early human societies were like. These societies resembled the idea of universal man embodied in the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights that was adopted in 1948. In 1942, Washburn was asked by the executive board of the American Anthropological Association to address the subject of race in his presidential address to that body. The issues of race and racism were once again making front page headlines in the United States because of the school integration mandated by the American Supreme Court 1954 decision in Brown v. Board of Education. Race and racism were also debated in virtually every number of current anthropology established between 1961 and October of 1963. These issues were provoked initially 
by Juan Comas' discussion of articles in the first issue of the Mankind Quarterly, which recycled old eugenics arguments that was purported to support claims regarding the immense inferiority of non-whites. The publication of Carlton Kuhn's The Origin of Races in 1962 added fuel to the fire. Kuhn classified the world's population into five races, which he argued were already identifiable during the Middle Paleocene. Furthermore, each race had its own nature and characteristics, implying that they had evolved more or less independently from one another for the last 500,000 years. Washburn, among others, argued that the goal of physical anthropology should not be the classification of human diversity, but the explanation of the processes and mechanisms that gave rise to it. While Kuhn sorted some people into a few types, Washburn advocated looking at how human variation was produced, selection, mutation, migration, and drift. For Washburn, some races were open systems in which are integrating the number of races will depend on the purpose of the classification. This, I think, a tremendously important point. It is significant that I was re reviewing classifications and preparing for this lecture. I found that almost none of them mentioned any purpose for which people were being classified. Race isn't very important biologically. Washburn reiterated his view that the members of the human species continue to survive through culture. He proceeded to argue that racism is based on a profound misunderstanding of culture, of learning, and of the biology of human species. That the racist arguments, such as the ones using differences in test scores, are not supported by modern scientists. He concluded his lecture with a statement couched on the language of classical liberalism. Human biology finds its realization in culturally determined way of life and the infinite variety of genetic combinations can only express themselves efficiently in a free and open society. The significant contribution of anthropologists during the years when one colony after another claimed political independence was that it was no longer possible to pretend that the world could be understood exclusively from a perspective of the West. They showed that other peoples had cultures and histories that were different from but necessarily related to their own. To understand the world properly, it was critical to know these cultures and histories in order to understand what was taking place and what had happened. Anthropologists provided a window of opportunity, a holistic perspective through which to view the cultures and histories of others. American Anthropology in Crisis from 1965 to 1973. The crises of American society were refracted in the dilemmas confronted by anthropologists from the mid-1960s through the early 1970s. These including the increasing polarization of the American people resulting from the U.S. war in Vietnam and its meddling in the internal affairs of other countries, the emergent and changing character of black and urban politics in the wake of Brown v. Board of Education, and the breakdown of the sustained economic growth of the post-war years. This situation prompted Stanley Diamond to write that, Anthropology, refined as the study of man, is the study of men in crisis by men in crisis. Anthropologists and their objects, the studied, despite opposing positions in the scientific equation, have this much in common. They are both, if not equally, objects of contemporary imperial civilization. The anthropologist who treats the indigene as an object may define himself as relatively free and integrated, a person, but that is an illusion. In order to objectify the other, one is, at the same time, compelled to objectify the self. By virtue of the problems that they raise and the availability of funds for investigation, the crises that crystallized during the mid-1960s underwrote the appearance of new fields of anthropological inquiry. For example, anthropologists working in Latin America and Africa began to pay attention to the problems encountered by rural immigrants to cities, and those working in the United States began to investigate the poor and working class immigrant 
and racialized communities and subcultures of urban neighborhoods. This led them to examine how these groups fit into larger structures through the social networks, class structures, and economic and political institutions and processes in which they participated. The crises also led anthropologists to recognize the inadequacies or limitations of prevailing theoretical perspectives and to explore other frameworks that potentially afforded more insightful understandings of the problems emerging in everyday life. They questioned the efforts of modernization theorists, structural functionalists, cultural evolutionists, and structuralists to explain the world around them. They replaced their views with ideas borrowed from the dependency theorists of Latin America, with feminist perspectives derived from the women's movement, and with Marxist viewpoints that incorporated both domestic and foreign strands of the Marxist tradition. Public disclosure and reaction to Project Camelot was an early warning of the crisis looming in anthropological profession. Project Camelot was a Department of Defense-funded study carry out by the Special Operations Research Office at the American University. SORO was a contract organization established in 1957 to serve the needs of the Psychological Warfare Directorate of the American Army. Initially, it concentrated its attention on foreign areas, on social revolutions, on how Communist Party organizations worked, and on tribal groups in various countries. In 1962, Soros' mission was expanded to include social research on counterinsurgency. By 1964, projects involving anthropologists or individuals representing themselves as anthropologists had been launched in Chile, Colombia, and Peru. The existence of Project Camelot, the research in Chile, became public in June 1965. The project was immediately canceled because of the outcries from the Chilean legislature, the State Department, social sciences, and the United States, and Latin America, and the press. At the fall 1965 meeting of the American Anthropological Association, the executive board appointed a committee to examine issues involving the relationship between anthropologists and agencies both governmental and private that sponsor their research. Among these issues are those of access to foreign areas, governmental clearance, professional ethics, and our responsibilities towards colleagues at home and abroad, the peoples with whom we work, and the sponsoring agencies. The integrity of the field worker himself. Is he attempting to serve the cause of basic science or the mission-directed role of a government agency, or both? Are these reconcilable? Ralph Beals, who headed the committee, subsequently testified before the Congressional Subcommittee on Government Research in June 1966. He noted that marginalized peoples studied by anthropologists often feared reprisals from their governments, that anthropologists did not want the information they connected in confidence used against their informants, and that Camelot-like projects were creating difficulties for anthropologists. He recommended that Activities of intelligence and mission-oriented agencies be divorced from those of the scientist. At the same time, he suggested that anthropologists might be employed in staff positions to identify problems and to interpret research findings. In January 1967, the Beals Committee on Research Problems and Ethics reported to the AAA. The voting members overwhelmingly adopted that it was a non-binding statement on professional ethics, and the executive board established on ad hoc ethics committee would meet for the first time in January 1969. However, in the report, Beals warned that the fellow should recognize that although Camelot is dead under that name, in a sense it has only gone underground. Similar types of projects have been conducted and are being planned under different names and through other kinds of agencies. Significant divisions appeared in the AAA at the 1966 annual meeting. AAA members who either supported the war in Vietnam or believed that the organization should not make political statements were incensed when their colleagues passed a resolution at the business meeting condemning the practices of the American military in its war against the people of Vietnam.
The resolution stated that we condemn the use of napalm, chemical defoliants, harmful gases, bombing, the torture and killing of prisoners of war and political prisoners, and the intentional or deliberate policies of genocide of forced transportation of population for the purpose of terminating their cultural and or genetic heritage by anyone anywhere. These methods of warfare deeply offended the human nature. We ask that all governments put an end to their use at once and proceed as rapidly as possible to a peaceful settlement of the war in Vietnam. While the supporters of the resolution condemned in the name of the association the actions of the U.S. military in Vietnam, their opponents argued that it was improper to involve the organization in what was clearly a political controversy. David Alberl and others who supported the resolution argued that anthropology had never been a value-free science and that genocide was, or ought to be, a concern of anthropologists. Project Camelot would seem like a dress rehearsal in the wake of events that began to unfold in March 1970. At that time, the Student Mobilization Committee to End the War in Vietnam obtained documents from files of a UCLA anthropologist which indicated that the professional expertise of several anthropologists working in Southeast Asia was being harnessed to counterinsurgency efforts in Thailand. The SMC showed the documents to Marshall Shallens, Gerald Berriman, Eric Wolf, and Joseph Jorgensen, all of whom were active in the anti-war movement and all of whom felt that the anthropologists named in the documents were violating the intent of the Beals report adopted three years earlier. Their public statements about the documents spread like wildfire across the country and through the profession. AAA President George Foster and some of the members of the executive board were critical of the actions and remarks of Berriman, Wolf, and Georgensen, who at the time were members of the Ethics Committee. The Ethics Committee responded, saying that Wolf, Georgensen, and Berriman had acted as individuals and that the documents supported their claims regarding unethical behavior. In November of 1970, the executive board established an ad hoc committee of inquiry chaired by Margaret Mead to deal with the controversy. The Mead report was released in November 1971 in time for discussion at the annual meeting. It suggested that counterinsurgency research is well within the traditional canons of acceptable behavior for the applied anthropologist and is counterinsurgent only present for funding purposes. A decade ago, it might have been called mental health. After whitewashing the activities of anthropologists involved in counterinsurgency research, the Mead Report condemned Wolf and Georgensen for the statements they made when documents were released by the SMC in March of 1970. At the long, acrominous business meeting, the voting members of the association rejected the report section by section. Two days later, the executive board passed a motion stating that the issues raised by the Thailand controversy remained unresolved. They were still unresolved 30 years later. The Thailand controversy, which was a symptom of the wider crisis in American society, was not the only expression of the crisis in the anthropological profession in the late 1960s. Kathleen Goh had already captured another facet of the problem in 1968 with her now famous article, Anthropology, Child of Imperialism, which appeared in the monthly review the most influential American Marxist journals. Go pointed out that many third world peoples involved in decolonization or national liberation movements saw anthropologists as part of the larger problem of American interference in the internal affairs of their countries. She argued persuasively that the discipline was neither objective nor neutral, that its establishment in universities was in part to serve and justify politics of domination. This was not the first time that Go had been at the center of political controversy and felt the wrath of the opposition. A few years earlier, at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, Go had given an electrifying speech at Brandeis University in which she supported the Cuban Revolution and expressed her fervent hope that Cuba would defend itself against the United States 
flagrant violation of international law. The Brandeis administration retaliated by forcing Go and Albert Berlo, her husband and colleague, out of the university in 1963. In a follow-up paper to Anthropology, Child of Imperialism, Go argued that it was time for anthropologists to reassess critically the roots of their discipline and to examine the social and political interests in which its practitioners have traditionally served. The concerns of this paper, controversial at the time, resonated with the sentiments expressed in the pages of current anthropology and in three edited collections that were published between 1969 in 1973. Delheim's Reinventing Anthropology, Robin Blackburn's Ideology and Social Science, Readings in Critical Social he Theory, and Talal Assad's Anthropology and the Colonial Encounter. The authors whose work appeared in the Himes volume, for example, called anthropology and its theories into question and advocate the developing of a reflexive critical anthropology. They pointed to the relationship between anthropology and racism, on the one hand, and the politics of African American culture on the other. They deployed concepts, imperialism, exploitation, resistance, neocolonialism, economic dependency, and hegemony, among others, that were more at home with, in Marxist traditions of social thought than they were in the various strands of social theory taught in American universities at the time. As the war continued, both left and right wings of the AAA tugged at the hearts and souls of liberals at the center. This temporarily weakened the influence of the centrists in the profession. One manifestation of this struggle was the appearance in 1968 of Marvin Harris's History of the Field, The Rise of Anthropological Theory, A History of the Theories of Culture. Harris used the historical development of anthropology in an effort to reestablish the political center of the deeply divided profession. There were two major dimensions to Harris's argument, one that was designed to appeal to the right, the other to the liberals and the elements of the new left. On the one hand, Harris, who claimed that Boas and his students were inductivists and eclectics who eschewed generalization in favor of particularism, they based their arguments on the collection of an ever-increasing number of facts and on the belief that conclusions about the significance of these facts would emerge from the data themselves. Their neo catan philosophical stance prevented the Boasians from constructing and elaborating any systemic body of social thought. The real appeal of Harris's arguments for the right was that it afforded an opportunity to minimize Boas's influence in the field. They shifted attention away from the public outrage Boas had expressed when he discovered that American anthropologists engaged in espionage activities during the First World War. They downplayed his lifelong struggles against racism and anti-Semitism and his fervid belief that anthropology should be a critical harnessing of the mind for promoting the general welfare of the most oppressed elements in society. The right used Harris's arguments to portray Boas as the middle-headed collector of facts unconcerned with generalization or theory. This perspective is reproduced in the often heard phrase, Boas was only a historical particularist. This phrase found a receptive audience among the students who were receiving their courses steady doses of social theory that was not late to practice. On the other hand, Harris appealed to the liberal and leftist students of the late 1960s by claiming that Marx was an important part of the intellectual heritage of modern anthropology. In his view, cultural anthropology developed entirely in reaction to, instead of independently of, Marxism. While this was probably not a surprise to the members of Harris's generation and its predecessors, it is an important argument at the time especially for students trained in the 1950s and 60s whose understanding and appreciation of Western social thought were severely constrained by the repressive climate of the Cold War. However, Harris had a particular viewpoint regarding the significance of Marx's and Engels' work for anthropology. He portrayed Marx and Engels as historical functionalists, like Spencer and Morgan, who believed that the various parts of culture were interrelated and 
and that the cause and effect relationship between the economic base and the superstructure provides the evolutionary consistency of social systems. In a phrase, the decisive advantage of the Marxian model is that it is diachronic and functional, not that it is dialectic. Harris proposed to rid Marxism of the Hegelian monkey on its back, the idea that social relations that exist in a class-based society at any given moment are the product of contradictory forces. In other words, class struggle was replaced with evolution. Harris believed that Marxists, especially members of communist parties, were fully prepared to corrupt scientific standards in order to prove by practice what their theories predicted and that they would not hesitate to falsify data in order to make them more useful. His rejection of the dialectic class struggle owed more to the anti-communist sentiments of the Cold War than to any appreciation of the perspective that groups engaged in political activity need the most accurate assessments possible of strengths and weaknesses of the forces they confront if they are to have any chance at all of making their own history. Cultural materialism was Harris's proposal for overcoming the weaknesses he saw in historical particularism and dialectical Marxism. Cultural materialism was empirical and scientific. It formulated society in terms of a cultural superstructure and a largely economic, technological infrastructure that mediated the relations between the members of a society and their environment. Relations that were understood partly in terms of Neo-Malthusian population pressure. Cultural materialism, like modernization theory and cultural evolutionism, ultimately perceived human history in terms of a progression of stages. In the 1960s, the dependency theorists in Latin America questioned the validity of the idea that history could be portrayed as a regular succession of stages. Both the evolutionists and the modernization theorists had argued that, if certain levels of investment in the forces of production or in particular groups occurred, then a capitalist society assembling those of the industrialized West would emerge. By contrast, the dependency theorists pointed out that in spite of high levels of investment, the countries of Latin America were not industrial capitalist societies. Their structures were, in fact, diverging from those of the industrial countries even as the amount of foreign investment increased. The reason for this, they argued, was that the developed industrial capitalist states and the underdeveloped countries of Latin America occupied that was bound together by unequal exchange relations. In their view, third world countries would never become industrial capitalist states in the same sense that the United States or England were. The Chicago trained economist Andre Gunder Frank did much to popularize dependency theory in the United States from the late 1960s onward through his critiques of mainstream development and modernization theory. Frank argued that economic underdevelopment of Latin American countries was a consequence of an exploitative relationship that extended from the capitalist metropoles in North America and Western Europe to the most remote reaches of their economically backward satellites in Latin America. He wrote that the now developed countries were never underdeveloped, though they may have been underdeveloped. It is also widely believed that the contemporary underdevelopment of a country can be understood as the product or ref reflection solely of its own economic, political, social, and cultural characteristics or structure. Yet historical research demonstrates that the contemporary underdevelopment is a large part of the historical product of past and the continuing economic and other relations between the satellite underdeveloped and the now developed metropolitan countries. Furthermore, these relations are an essential part of the structure and development of the capitalist system on a world scale. The underdevelopment of the Latin American countries was, in Frank's view, reproduced by the contradictions inherent in capitalism. This challenged prevailing views that capitalist development and modernization
were equally beneficial to all of the countries involved. Peasantry's perplexed liberal theorists of change who predicted that rural class structures would eventually disappear as industrialization proceeded and rural peoples moved to the cities in search of higher wages and better standards of living. What was perplexing was that peasant communities were not disappearing in countries experiencing economic development and modernization. In fact, they seemed to be resisting these processes. Thus, one consequence of the intensification of the Vietnam War was that a few social scientists, including Eric Wolf, began to explore the relationship between peasants and social revolution. What was most important about Wolf's widely acclaimed book, Peasant Wars of the 20th Century, was the close attention he paid to the historic specificity and particularities of peasant revolutions in Mexico, Russia, China, Cuba, Algeria, and Vietnam. Wolf observed that peasant rebellions just mentioned parochial reactions to major social dislocations set in motion by major societal changes associated with the spread of capitalism, markets, and the capitalist economic rationality. They were launched by land-holding peasants with the material and organizational advantages that their sharecropper and rural proletarian neighbors lacked. The battlefield of their rebellions was society itself, where the peasantry was successfully rebelled against the established order, under its own banner and with its own leaders, it was sometimes able to reshape the social structure of the countryside closer to its heart desire, but did not lay hold of the state, of the cities which house the centers of control, of the strategic non-agricultural resources of the society. Thus a peasant rebellion, which takes place in a complex society already caught up in the commercialization and industrialization trends, tends to be self-limiting and hence anarchistic. The peasant's role in social revolution was, for Wolf, both tragic and hopeful. Tragic because their efforts ushered in even more uncertainty, and hopeful because theirs is the party of humanity. As Wolf turned his gaze towards peasant communities in distant lands, other anthropologists focused their attention on the intersection of class, culture, and inequality in urban America. In the early 1960s, Oscar Lewis had put forward a useful thesis regarding the interrelations of class, culture, and inequality based on the work in Mexico City and San Juan, Puerto Rico. This was the culture of poverty thesis. In Lewis's view, the culture of poverty originated in a class stratified, rapidly developing capitalist societies and in colonial societies and mesh and imperialist social relations. The most likely candidates for the culture of poverty are the people who come to urban slums from the lower strata of rapidly changing society and are already partially alienated from it. The culture of poverty is not only an adaptation to set an objective conditions in a larger society. Once it comes into existence, it tends to perpetuate itself from generation to generation because of its effect on children. By the time some children are age six or seven, they have usually absorbed the basic values and attitudes of their subculture and are not psychologically geared to take the full advantage of changing conditions or increased opportunities which may occur in their lifetime. Senator Daniel P. Moyahan, who held a number of sub-cabinet positions in the early 1960s and was the director of the MIT-Harvard Joint Center for Urban Studies in the late 1960s, adopted the culture of poverty in his Negro family, the case for national action. Moynihan asserted that the African-American family was at the center of a tangle of pathology the principal source of the most abhorrent, inadequate, or antisocial behavior that did not establish but now serves to perpetuate the cycle of poverty and deprivation. Eleanor B. Leacock was among the first anthropologists to critique the culture of poverty thesis's 
put forward by Lewis and Moynihan. She developed this critique in her introduction to an edited volume, The Culture of Poverty, a Critique, that appeared in 1971. Here she sought to explain how and why the cultural differences between classes emerged and were reproduced. Leacock wrote that, Differences between the poor and non-poor in society stem from three sources. First, there are the different traditions of peoples with different histories. These are often reinforced by racial or religious segregation and discrimination. Second, there are the realistic attempts to deal with the objective conditions that vary from one class to another. There is no hard, fast line between this order of behavior. And the third, which are those adaptive acts and attitude that become institutionalized and incorporated into internalized values and norms appropriate for living in a given position in the social economic system. It is what culture of poverty is supposedly documenting. However, sociocentric methods of data collection and analysis, plus a non historical theory of culture and its relation to personality, have contributed to a stereotypical and distorted views of these class linked variations. Thus, in her opinion, the culture of poverty theorists, Lewis and Moynihan, viewed the relation between culture and personality too narrowly. They imposed their own middle class values on the interactions with informants and consequently misrepresented the working class culture, and they did not adequately appreciate that middle-class solutions to the realities of everyday life were not necessarily available for members of the working class. Leacock made other significant contributions to anthropology in the early 1970s besides her critique of culture of poverty thesis. One of the more important was the introduction she wrote for a new edition of Frederick Engels' Origin of the Family, Private Property in the State that was published in 1972 by International Publishers, the publishing house of the Communist Party of the United States. In the introduction, she examined how anthropological research shed new light on the arguments that Engels had made nearly a century earlier. These included the political implications of cultural or social evolutionary theory, primitive communism, and the emergence of the states. Most important, however, was her discussion of Engels' arguments about the subjugation of women and the emergence of monogamy, private property, and state. This paved the way for subsequent discussions of women's issues and gender in American anthropology and served a basis for two important collections of essays that appeared in the mid-1970s, Michelle Rosaldo and Louise Lampier's Women, Culture, and Society, and Rhino Rap Reader's toward an anthropology of women. Leacock suggested that Engels' arguments about the subordination of women were essentially correct and that they were supported by anthropological data. Engels had argued that the position of women relative to men deteriorated with the advent of class society and the state. Thus, the subordination of women was neither an integral feature of the human condition nor universal, as many cultural evolutionists implied. Instead, it was an integral feature of the historically contingent processes associated with class and state formation, the simultaneous dissolution of institutions and practices that benefit the community as a whole, and the emergence of social relations that benefit the members of a particular group at the expense of their kin and neighbors. Leacock's exhortation to examine women's roles in kin-organized communities and class-stratified societies came at an opportune moment. It was during the political and social crisis of the late 1960s that the traditional assumptions of anthropologists were being challenged from inside and outside the profession. What Leacock helped establish at that instant was an explicitly Marxist feminist perspective and practice.